Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to present this new paper to a wide audience. And I hope you'll pose questions throughout so we can have an interesting discussion following the presentation. Melissa, do I? Oh, wait. Okay, I remember how to do this. All right. Um, here's an overview of the presentation, which follows the flow of the published paper. Um, first, a bit about why, then who, then the content. Okay, so why did I decide to write this piece? Over the years, I felt increasingly that many digital library projects could have been even better if archival expertise had been brought to bear on their planning, design, and content. Archivists and special collections librarians are, of course, routinely involved in digitization projects since they're so often the custodians of the material being digitized. Far fewer have been involved, however, with institutional repositories, research data management, or other contexts that involve materials beyond the usual scope of the archives, per se. By the way, I, um, when I say archivists or archives from this point forward, I mean to subsume special collections librarians and special collections as well. The desire to mainstream archives into the broader research library increasingly has been a goal of library directors for years. I remember it being the central theme of a Rare Books and Manuscripts conference more than 20 years ago. Mainstreaming the archives means including its staff and activities in the full array of library initiatives from collecting metadata creation to teaching and outreach in order to reduce isolation and increase relevance. My point is that yet another means of mainstreaming the archives is to leverage archivist expertise as broadly as possible in the digital context, which has become so all-encompassing all in libraries and archives. In no way does this imply that all born digital materials should be moved under the purview of the archives, far from it. It's all about collaboration and informing each other's perspectives by cross-fertilization of expertise. Okay, uh, in OCLC research, we often involve external colleagues in our work in order to greatly extend our own expertise. Sometimes we establish formal working groups composed principally of members of our OCLC research library partnership. Ricky Irway and I have greatly benefited from collaborating with a group of informal advisors over the past three years in our demystifying born digital work agenda. Oops. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Ricky's influential reports that have helped countless archives get started in this area. For this paper, I expanded the stable of experts to include research library directors, heads of special collections who aren't archivists, and several information technology experts. Given the nature of my argument that archivists can greatly contribute to born digital planning and management across the entire library, I needed feedback from experts in these other areas too. I can't thank them enough for their contributions, which included both broadening my own perspective and correcting some misguided assumptions of mine. While each reviewer focused on points about which they were particularly knowledgeable or particularly confused by what I was trying to say, there was one point on which most of them had an opinion. Should I use the term born digital or just digital when referring to materials created and managed in digital form? Some non-archivists felt that born digital is a term used only by archivists, while some archivists held the view that digital sows confusion by being too general. And there were many variations um, on that theme. I ultimately punted and used them both, choosing whichever one felt more accurate in the particular context. And I mention this just in case any of you find the term born digital to be at all jarring. If so, just think digital, created and managed in digital form. Before diving into the content of the report itself, I'd like to give a, a nod to my OCLC research colleagues, Brian Lavoy and Constance Malthus, who've made a huge contribution, contribution to the research library community by naming, defining, and creating a framework for what they've dubbed the evolving scholarly record. I gotta get the hang of this clicking thing. The materials created throughout the scholarly process, that's the scholarly throughout the process, before, during, and after formal publication. The framework provides a high-level view of the categories of material that the scholarly record encompasses, as well as the key stakeholder roles associated with creation, management, and use of the scholarly record. By definition, most, if not all, of this material is born digital these days. This graphic illustrates the flow of scholarly processes, from development of research methods to reuse of outcomes, 
that produce outputs which may be appropriate for research libraries to collect. Here are some thoughts with which archivists can, can easily identify. Scholarly outcomes are contextualized by materials generated in the process and aftermath of scholarly inquiry. The research process generates materials covering methods employed, evidence used, and formative discussion. Research aftermath generates materials covering discussion, revision, and reuse. The two evolving scholarly record reports are on the OCLC Research website, and I think Melissa will be posting the URLs in the chat um, in the chat box. And our blog, uh, hangingtogether.org, includes numerous posts based on a series of workshops that we've hosted over the past year. Related to this, it seems to me that most of which has, what has been traditionally considered gray literature is also now born digital. Preprints, position papers, conference papers, radical polemics, artistic manifestos, they're all on the web. Depending on their content, some of this now digital gray literature is part of the scholarly record, while some comprises pieces of the cultural record. Many archives and special collections solely collect the cultural record, while those situated in universities tend to collect both. If you're attending the Society of American Archivists in con conference in Cleveland next week, um, take note that session 209, invited, entitled The Evolving Archival Record, will explore the relationship between the two, scholarly and cultural records. Brian will be chairing a panel of archivists who will discuss the implications of this work for archives. Okay, the restructure of the reports, um, four sections. Here they are, and I'll be going through them in sequence. So who is the audience for this work? My intended primary audience is the broad array of research library colleagues who are involved in aspects of planning and implementing digital libraries and who are not archivists. These are the people who may be faced with questions of the sort that I posed throughout the last section of the paper, and we'll go over some of those later. Each group has its own expertise in a particular area, some of which is complementary to archivist expertise, and some of which may overlap. I also hope the report will prove useful to all of you archivists out there, some of whom, I hope, are called upon to participate in digital initiatives beyond the archives, and others of whom may already be trying to make arguments similar to mine. And I mean to include all archivists, not just those with digital archivist skills. It's my view that our traditional, if you will, skills and knowledge transfer easily to the digital context, though often requiring um, that new dimensions of an issue be taken into account. I've tried to describe in the paper the areas of archival expertise in a way that will be meaningful to non-archivists. Doing so effectively can be tricky, given, as probably any archivist knows, given, given that professionals in any area employ jargon that colleagues in other areas may not understand. It would be terrific if some of the explanations in the report can help other archivists find the right words during their conversations with colleagues. For each area of expertise, the report also includes several sample questions of the sort that might arise in practical situations. Today I'll be using one question to illustrate each of the 10 areas. If you're an archivist, as I go along, you might want to think about how you would answer these when asked, as well as the extent to which it'll be necessary to broaden your own knowledge of born digital management in order to address some of the questions that come your way. So in order to set the stage for discussion of particular types of expertise, I've articulated some of the essential characteristics of archival materials. Let's look at a few of them on this list. Because archival materials, particularly aggregated collections, are unpublished, they're by definition not publicly accessible until an institution acquires them and provides access. And thereafter, they're likely to be accessible only via that one institution. Many of the other archival characteristics flow from this very basic one. Also, a very small percentage of archival materials out in the wild warrant acquisition. While this is also true for any library's acquisition policies, it's even more so with archival materials because the universe of con content is, for all intents and purposes, infinite. While all unique materials may seem precious, much of it is simply not worthy of the resources that would be expended on it, particularly if it has no clear potential users 
um, case in point, the National Archives of the U.S. Um, collects only about 2% of the records generated by the federal government, the ones that they've determined have permanent importance. Um, next uh, characteristic, collections can be enormous, uh, as in hundreds or even thousands of feet of shelf space, thank Congressman, and many of them grow over time. This has numerous implications for collections management, preservation, and description. It also means that the relationship with donors continues. Um, another uh, characteristic, restrictions on access or use are far from ubiquitous but are relatively common. They can be based in law, such as privacy of medical information, or on donor requirements, such as deeply personal information that's to be held private until the donor's death. And some of the other points on this slide um, I'll address later on. I compiled this list with analog, meaning physical, materials in mind, and then revisited it through a digital lens to surface those characteristics that may not be so obvious, that may not so obviously apply to the digital context context. For example, what's an original when exact copies can be so easily generated? How can websites have archival characteristics given that they're usually publicly accessible without restriction? And is there a need for security in the context of public use of digital records? Next, I outlined some characteristics of born digital materials relating them to the analog equivalents of some particular kinds of content. So in this, on this uh, table, um, types of material on the left, regardless of um, format, um, analog equivalents, and then sample digital formats, most of which are equivalent. Most of the analog formats have one or more digital equivalents, while for others, the equivalencies are unclear. For example, consider correspondence. It's communication between a writer and her intended recipient. In the analog world, we immediately think of letters, and we know that they typically consist of text committed to paper. The letter may be handwritten or typewritten. It's still a letter, and it's physically delivered from author to recipient. The format and means of delivery for digital correspondence, on the other hand, can change dramatically depending on the method used, such as an email system or word processing software. Do we write letters on social media platforms? Are Facebook or Twitter posts the equivalent? Strictly speaking, the answer is irrelevant. What's significant is that these new forms of communication can easily be construed as brief online correspondence that fits squarely within the purview of the types of archival collection that typically include correspondence. Materials in all of those sample digital formats can be archival, uh, though not all are. Think about um, or compare a CD containing unpublished photographs or a DVD of raw video footage as contrasted with a published music CD or a commercial film on DVD. Those items with archival characteristics are typically within scope for acquisition by an archive and are likely to be managed as part of a collection, while published items flow through library acquisition processes and are described and made available as items. So this section of the paper continues by considering the archival characteristics of research data, websites, and email. When equivalent content is in analog form, it's likely to be in the archives. When it's born digital, however, any of these materials are likely to be managed elsewhere in the library. Research data may be housed within the institutional repository or even elsewhere on campus. Subject specialist librarians may be responsible for acquiring websites and library catalogers describing them. And email may be simply backed up by the IT department for a specified period of time. The core argument of the paper is this. Because such materials, and many more, such as blogs and other social media, have strong archival characteristics, there's great value in involving archivists in their curation and management, even though another library unit may be principally responsible. OK, on to the heart of the matter, 10 areas of archival expertise of value in the digital library context. So what are they? Here they are. Archivists uh, will note that lots of other skills are missing, uh, such as records management, life cycle management. Um, I couldn't do it all. But I think these 10 have uh, really good resonance for uh, the digital library context. 
Okay, let's go through them one by one. The orders based very roughly on the order in which issues might be encountered in the process of acquiring and managing digital materials, but don't assign too much meaning to the order. First, ownership. Almost everything is owned by someone, and when acquiring archival material, we have to know that the person offering a donation has the right to do so. Usually that's the case, but archivists are alert to the possibility that it's not. This is best illustrated, I think, by an example. In my previous position at the University of California, Irvine, the daughter of a man who had been the manager of a local water district for many years offered me um, about six feet of decades-old records of that district. Uh, water, as you may know, is a hugely important issue in California and always has been. It's nothing new. She was moving to a smaller house. Um, moving house or office may be the number one impetus for offering archival materials to an institution, by the way. Um, and she thought, hmm, these may be valuable. Maybe I should contact UCI. When I saw what she was offering, I asked whether the water district was aware that she had them, since I noted that they were official records, and the answer was no. She got in touch with current officials, who she knew well, and put us in contact. They were thrilled to know that part of their early history survived. We executed a deed of gift, more on that later on, and the collection has proved an important one. But it could have been a real problem if the Water District had learned after the fact that we had these materials and were making them publicly available. So here's a sample question relating to ownership. What does ownership mean when it's so easy to make identical copies of digital files? Well, the files that are or were in the hand of the creator or heir are the originals in the sense that they're the authentic version. Remember that word, authentic. Copies acquired from someone else may have been altered in the course of reuse or even just handling. Archives want to, require, want to acquire materials from the original source whenever possible for this reason. Next, donor relations. These are factors to address when working with donors of digital content. Issues can be sensitive. Donors may even be emotional about letting go. Uh, relationships can be long and must be actively stewarded. The idea of public access to their materials, even if it's, a, for example, a university office, um, can be a real question. Here's another example from my Irvine experience. Um, we had also acquired the papers of the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, known as the father of deconstruction and world-renowned. He took huge interest in his archive, exerting complete control over who could make copies, requesting that we host major events every year or two, visiting annually, and even referring to the archive in his work. Just about any person of prominent stature would behave the same way and with good reason, and that was a relationship that definitely needed to be stewarded, um, including um, following his demise. So here's a sample question relating to uh, working with donors. Do we have to ask the donor before we recover digital deleted files? If the donor or heir is still alive, absolutely. They may say yes, and they may say no. They may say, I have no idea, tell me what's there. An author such as Derry Da might have said, yes, absolutely, lots of these are versions of my writings and scholars may be interested. A scientist, on the other hand, may say, no, those are versions of my writings and scholars won't be interested. Regardless, deleted files are the equivalent of analog materials not consciously donated. Intellectual property, or the legal ownership of the intellectual property rights. Ownership of copyright is completely distinct from ownership of the archival materials per se. Libraries know this. Um, they own copies of the book, but they don't own the copyright. Many donors don't realize they own any rights, though, let alone which ones. In most cases, a donor owns copyright only in some of the materials donated, um, those that she created or inherited. A literary author's rights include his own manuscripts, whether or not he has the rights in his um, published works, but not, for example, incoming correspondence received from other people or publicity photographs taken by the publisher. Copyright is therefore a core issue in both negotiating and managing um, archival materials. A donor may opt to transfer these rights to the institution or may choose to retain them. Retention of rights is important, for example, to the heirs of any literary author whose work generates income, which may be substantial and, thanks to copyright, length of copyright uh, persistence, um, that income may continue for decades. Across the spectrum of archival donations, though, materials that have income potential comprise a very small percentage. 
intellectual property rights have to be managed over the life of the collection as well. It's routine to require that anyone requesting copies, whether physical or digital, sign a form stating that they understand their responsibility for not violating anyone's copyrights. Okay, a sample question related to intellectual property. What happens if the donor doesn't know who holds copyright? Archivists know the questions to ask to explore that. They also know who's likely to hold the rights in unpublished materials, as well as the types of material that are likely to be orphans and consequently could be made safe to um, could be safe to make available digitally despite not having a copyright owner to consult. Archivists also know how to research um, the potential for finding a copyright owner. Next, appraisal. This doesn't mean in the monetary sense. This means determining the significance of the material in the context of the, inst context of the institution's collecting mission. The, contact, the content really needs to be sufficiently significant to warrant the cost of acquisition, preservation, access, storage, and all other considerations. It also needs to have strong potential to attract users. Archives are frequently offered materials that fall outside their scope. It can be very tempting to say yes if the stuff seems important, but it's really important to have a policy that discourages accepting out-of-scope materials. There's likely a better home, and we routinely point donors in another direction. One could say a lot more about how those situations play out. It's not always straightforward, but um, nevertheless. So a sample question in the digital context. Should we consider the high cost of processing materials in, in obsolete digital formats as part of the appraisal decision? I'd say it depends. How much material is there? Do you know anything about the content? The cost of conversion can be huge depending on the volume of material and the format it's in. So neither retention nor disposal should be a knee-jerk decision. Next, the context of creation and use. This isn't a concept that's, um, per, that per, pertains particularly when buying library materials, although some issues like who's the author, who's the publisher um, pertain. But for in archival context, it's really quite different. The it's the circumstances under which the materials were produced and their relationship to the creator's overall output. Context is established. Um, by learning what those circumstances are, um, also considering the intended use of the material, this is necessary to understand to do the appraisal and to understand the full significance. Here's a sample question for digital. What sort of contextual information is needed for scientific research data? Imagine being offered years of lab data on physical media with no information about the nature of the principal of investigators, and that could be singular or plural. Um, the nature of their work, their prominence, their collaborations, their lab structure, and their publication record. Simply asking what's the data on the tapes is far from sufficient to advise a scientist about issues such as length of retention um, and at what point access can be permitted. Authenticity. I mentioned this earlier in the context of, of archives preferring to receive materials from their creator. So. Um, Authenticity refers to the factors that help determine whether the materials can serve as an accurate, reliable record of the creator's output. An authentic document is one that's complete and unchanged since it left the custody of its creator. Inauthentic analog documents, documents may well have been consciously ordered, altered, think forgery, but with digital materials, changes may have been completely inadvertent. Here's a really basic fact um, in managing digital materials. If you open, just merely opening a file may change or damage it. Um, a sample question. Are the copies that we make for digital processing and preservation considered authentic? Well, that depends on whether you follow proper digital forensic techniques to ensure that you make authentic copies. And once made, they have to be managed in a way that ensures accuracy over time. This is a very big deal, and it's very expensive. Think supercomputer. It's not necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily require a supercomputer, but um, that level of capability, many of those characteristics of um, how supercomputers um, safeguard uh, content over time are relevant. 
Next issue, uh, limitations on access to or use of the material. So whereas library materials are by definition acquired for use without restriction, some types of archival material cannot be made inaccessible due to requirements of U.S. or state statutes or donor requirements or privacy issues or intellectual property considerations. So um, a sample question. A professor donates her scholarly papers and includes materials relating to former students. Can we provide digital access to papers written by students as course assignments? And what about letters of recommendation for students? The shorter answer is probably not against the law, but probably not a good idea. Many archives um, operate as though federal law governing privacy of official student records, uh, this law is known as FERPA, F-E-R-P-A, requires that such material be restricted for decades, privacy reasons. A reading of the law shows that such materials aren't covered under FERPA, on the other hand, because they're not considered official student records. But on the other hand, certainly there are privacy considerations, so the archives and institution may be best served by now not allowing access for many years. Next, transfer of ownership. We started with ownership, and now once we've gone through all these various considerations, um, let's talk about uh, acquiring this material. So um, transfer involves um, establishing the terms and conditions to be discussed at the time of transferring ownership. Prior to taking custody of any donation, arch archivists, uh, archives execute a formal deed of gift to cement the deal. Deeds range from the simple to the complex, depending on the circumstances. A lot of mine at UC Irvine were a simple page long. Most open with a statement such as, I own this stuff and I'm transferring title permanently to Institution X. Deeds also address issues such as transfer or retention of intellectual property, what to do with duplicate material, whether any restrictions are to apply, and the circumstances under which users may copy the materials. The bottom line is this, the deed settles any future questions that may arise regarding whether the gift was legally made and the terms that were specified at the time. So a sample question, is a deed of gift necessary for a professor's research data? Um, I'm not familiar with that field to know how this is being handled, but here's, um, here's how I would respond. The first question is whether ownership is actually going to be ceded to the institution. In most circumstances, I suspect the answer is no. The library or other organizational unit that will be responsible for managing the data may be its caretaker rather than its owner. Regardless, an agreement similar to a deed should outline the terms, where the data will be housed, restrictions that may be imposed for how long it will be retained and who can access it. Permanence. Um, preservation of the authentic materials into the foreseeable future. Questions might arise in the digital context about continuing to vote to devote server space to material that's seen little or no use several years after being acquired. While it's too early in our experience for most archives to have faced this issue, it's definitely going to arise. If you're an IT manager and see that the data on some large servers haven't been touched in years, it's certainly a viable question. Yes, space is cheap and getting speed cheaper, but we've barely scratched the surface of how much space we're going to need. Talking about gigabytes and terabytes is going to seem quaint at some point. Let's see what's bigger than a petabyte. Here's a sample question. If standard backup systems aren't sufficient, for preserving files over the long term, what type of environment meets digital preservation standards? In short, very short, a variety of IT routines that can periodically determine whether or not files have changed, servers have died, and much else. You may find that your IT department isn't yet aware of the ramifications of authentic and permanent storage. First, just make sure they won't be writing over the server when the usual retention period for backups arrives. Okay, the last area of expertise that I'm going to address, um, working with collection level metadata. Wait, I feel like I lost a slide. Nope. Efficient creation of contextual and descriptive data for discovery and access um, is made at the collection level by archives. And while collection level cataloging is far from unknown to librarians, it's the archival norm rather than the exception. 
The data elements that are standard in library cataloging, uh, such as author, title, dates of creation, a summary of contents, have to be discovered by analyzing the material and its context, because more often than not, they don't explicitly appear on either the collection as a whole or any particular piece. Think about whether in digital libraries, item level cataloging, um, even though it's prevalent, is either scalable or necessary. A sample question, is one metadata record sufficient for a complex website that includes lots of different types of content? It may well be enough. If it's an organization's website, it's likely a lot more important to understand the institution's purpose and priorities, the context, than to see each page or document described in detail. Many users won't have an item in mind at all and will find value in understanding the big picture before they want to drill down. That said, current practices for creating metadata for websites is all over the map. Um, I can think of the, the example of Stanford University, which has made a uh, collection level finding aid that represents all of its websites harvested for student groups on campus. Um, it lets users know that they are collected and that they can archive, they can contact the archives um, to get access to them. Okay, here's one more look at the 10 areas of expertise. I hope you'll consider starting a conversation about these issues at your institution. If you're a library director, does the basic premise that archivists have a lot to contribute make sense? If you're an IT professional, are the descriptions of technical issues, such as recovery of content from obsolete media, useful? If you're a faculty liaison librarian, have any of the sample questions arisen in conversation with scholars? If you're an archivist, think about the areas in which you feel how you have the most to offer. And let me know if you think I failed to make a convincing case or got it wrong, or discussion with colleagues leads to pushback against any of these ideas. And of course, read the report. Uh, we've set up a brief um, URL for it, and uh, write it down. So thank you so much. Um, Let's uh, see what questions you have and, and talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, we did get one uh, question via Twitter from Katie Van Arsdale. And her question, my big question, she asks, is how do we archive websites and digital institutional publications? Oh, boy, is that a big question. Um, it's, it's complicated. The, there's only one tool out there that's um, really available for, for use in harvesting, Archive It. It's um, owned and operated by the Internet Archive, um, which is a nonprofit, um, but it costs money. Um, and uh, you could go to their website and get a sense of how it works. You set up a profile for archiving, et cetera. When you're in a university or any other kind of organizational archive, um, harvesting your institution's own publications is really a very top priority because if you're a university archivist, for example, you know that very little of that stuff that used to physically come in the door is produced in any way other than on the web. Um, I recently was able to go to a couple of days of um, the uh, IIPC conference, International Something for Something Preservation. Um, but it's all about archiving websites. And um, a lot of computer sciences, scientists attend, and they can go into great detail about um, the complexities of web archiving, how you often cannot be sure that you um, have the entire thing, um, issues related to um, uh, accuracy of the crawl and what, how that plays out in legal situations. Anyway, so um, the basic, basic notion of um, contracting with Arch Archive It to do crawls um, of your specified websites um, is pretty straightforward, costs money depending on how much and how deeply you want to crawl. Um, but then beyond that, there are many, many, many issues. Um, the Society of American Archivists has a web archiving roundtable that um, um, you can get on their uh, listserv mailing list, whether or not you're a member of SAA, and they do really good work um, publishing um, 
uh, information about, um, about web archiving. So you could consider following that. Thanks, Jackie. There's another question via chat from Claudia Holland. And the question is, to what degree does an archivist become involved in negotiating copyright transfer, or is that turned over to university counsel? How important is copyright transfer to an archive, particularly in continuing orphan work, excuse me, orphan works headaches? Oh, you guys are asking big questions. Um, to what degree an archivist becomes involved in negotiating copyright transfer? Um, an archivist is always the first to work with a potential donor to discuss the implications. Um, I would venture to say that, at least in the um, archives where I've worked, uh, rarely is transferring of the copyright to the institution um, complicated in any way. Uh, retention of copyrights. Um, oh, well, okay, let me start over. Um, in most cases, trans, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm th having too many thoughts to um, answer with only one. Let's see. So um, in most cases where I was acquiring materials that wasn't um, uh, of sort of, um, you know, wasn't where the creator wasn't um, Jacques Derrida um, uh, and there was no um, potential for income being um, um, generated by the materials, I would suggest to the, to the donor that um, it simplifies our management of that material if you transfer it to us, if you transfer the, the copyright to the university. And then the way it played out was it only meant that when someone wanted to publish materials um, from those papers, that we didn't have to consult anybody about um, about whether that was okay. On the other hand, if this were, say, um, um, a very important person, a ma famous literary author transferring, who in fact wants to give their their copyrights to the university, I would definitely consult counsel because um, you would want to be sure that um, there was going to be a process put in place for managing those, for managing the income, for making decisions about whether or not to approve requests to publish and, and such. Let's see, was there another part of that? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, how important is copyright transfer? Well, okay. Um, as I said, um, the chief uh, value of transfer in routine cases is that then it simplifies management. Um, in light of continuing orph orphan work headaches, then there is no potential for transferring copyrights because we don't know who owns it. And the comment I made about um, being able to have a good sense of which archival materials um, would be orphaned, um, it's, and you know, and that that makes it easier to digitize them. You know, that's kind of a controversial thing to say. Um, you know, but again, with you know bazillions of individual archival items um, and that are, you know, sometimes very old and um, you don't even know who wrote them or it's a nonprofit organization that's gone out of business, um, the risks are much lower. I hope that helps. Thanks, Jackie. There's another question via chat from Meg Phillips. Thank you for making this case, Jackie. It seems compelling to me, but of course, I work for the National Archives and Records Administration. Do you have a sense that this is a hard case to make because few people are familiar with archival competencies, or do library administrators see these connections naturally? Um, well, I wrote this paper because I think the case needs to be made um, based on the fact that in some of these areas, uh, I see archivists um, not very often being involved. And the fact that I focused on explicating areas of archival competence and trying to set them in the context of digital, you know, it, the whole point is to um, make it possible for readers of the report um, to get familiar with archival competencies. And uh, what I, what I would, uh, in my dreams, see happening is that it may be archivists who 
um, are most easily reached by the paper. It has archival in the title a couple of times. Um, but I, it would, the ideal for me it would be that um, archivists then take it forward into their library and start these conversations. Thanks, Jackie. Um, here's another question via Twitter that's kind of along those same lines. This is from F. Bennett. Jackie, what are some ways we can sell our skills to external stakeholders, mostly thinking outside of the library arch archival advantage? Thinking outside of the library. Um, well, I guess I would start by saying uh, it can be just as challenging inside the library, but um, by demonstrating our competence, by um, making by by tying um, by tying what we know to a practical a real world situation that they're facing um, those are two really major ways and being able to explain what it is we know um, and apply that to um, to real cases is is at the heart of it. Um, I have a friend, a digital archivist, who's prone to say the, the only way you can really sell the value of uh, proper management of digital archives um, is uh, when there's a huge scandal or disaster. <laughs> and unfortunately, that is sometimes the case. Um, a lot of you may be familiar, for example, with a really upsetting incident that happened at the University of Oregon the, either um, earlier this year when the president's office had um, sent a lot of the president's email files to the archives um, and uh, without vetting it to see if there was confidential information or just information that they would not want to have be made public. Um, and then um, without the, the archives was very, very short on staff. This was a 50,000 plus messages they didn't have the staff to vet the entire content. A faculty member asked if he could have it for his scholarly purposes. They gave it to him, and then all hell broke loose. Um, and two, two archivists lost their jobs. Um, but I be, we'd be willing to bet that the University of Oregon is really looking at the staffing of the university archives. They immediately applied half a dozen staff from I don't know where, um, to vetting all of that email. <laughs> they made the professor give it back. You know, that's a really extreme case, but it's the kind of thing that, um, you know, if one can lobby ahead of time, if one can successfully lobby ahead of time for proper, you know, to help people understand what the um, ramifications could be of not having enough staff for records management, um, you know, you would hope that you can uh, – stave off such problems, but um, at Oregon, the University Archives was not, worked very hard at it, but was not able to be successful in making that case. I hope that helps. Thanks, Jackie. There aren't any other questions, so um, if any of you do have questions, please submit them via chat here or um, via Twitter with the hashtag archival-advantage. Um, okay, Melissa, we'll, a, couple, a couple more have come in now. Oh, yeah, I just see that. I'm sorry. I must have a delay here. Um, from Eileen Lim, digital archivists with technical skills to process digital content can be challenging to find. How would you suggest archivists obtain these skills and competencies? Um, well, two things. First of all, I want to make sure it's clear that um, – it's my belief that archivists who only have the traditional, um, in other words, analog-based skills, are able to deal with a lot of these issues, even if they haven't yet become educated to learn all about digital archives. Um, if you go back and look at some of the, you know, the way that I'm describing the skills and um, how to think about situations that arise, um, in many cases, an archivist wouldn't have to understand um, the digital issues in order to have a conversation. For example, all of the donor relations issues. Yes, there, is a, there are a lot more um, pieces to a conversation with a donor who's donating digital materials, but there's also a huge amount of really excellent information um, out there about how to, um, how to handle those kinds of materials. For example, there's a fantastic website 
Um, first author of the material is uh, Gabrielle Redwine from Yale. Um, that's all about negotiating um, digital donations. But in terms of um, are there digital archivists out there um, and how can others obtain the skills, there are more and more and more um, archivists who are developing these skills. Um, a huge way, there are two ways in which that's happening. Some uh, graduate schools of archival education have really strong curricula in this area. Um, I would point, first of all, to the University of North Carolina. Several faculty in this area have excellent programs, so they're turning out um, MLIS uh, archivists, qualified archivists, um, who can walk in and know all of these kinds of issues. But also, uh, for the last three or four years, the Society of American Archivists has been promulgating a really fantastic um, program of education that they call Digital Archivist Competencies. Anyway, it's a curriculum of maybe 30 courses that are available, and um, one can get a, a, a certificate at the end that uh, after taking eight courses and passing exams along the way, a comprehensive exam at the end, um, and demonstrating that you, they know they know a huge amount about managing digital archives. So, and I don't have numbers at hand, but over a thousand um, people have taken at least one of those courses, and almost and about 200 of them have already gained that certification. So, these folks are out there. They're increasingly out there. Thanks, Jackie. Um, here's another question from Amber Scants. We've seen a decrease in the amount of records since things have gone digital, specifically where we did previously get a lot of memos and staff communication documents, we are seeing significantly less now. Most of our institutionally provided storage is on the cloud outside of what archives maintains in terms of hard drives. How do we address what we are thinking is a concern for privacy in the cloud? Is this same decrease seen elsewhere? It seems like we have gone closer to paperless. Excuse me. It seems like as we have gone closer to paperless, we are getting fewer things sent in. Oh, absolutely the case for institutional archives, including university archives, um, which is why getting a grip on first and foremost uh, capturing websites is so important. Um, does anybody still have a uh, paper general catalog listing all of the uh, course requirements, um, the faculty, et cetera, et cetera, um, and the difference between bringing in a, a you know, a, an annual um, serial volume, in effect, and um, gathering up all of the content that goes into making the online catalog is just extraordinary. Um, so websites are a great place to start, and if you think about all the kinds of uh, graduate program brochure, uh, brochures, um, uh, you know, just en newsletters, endless kinds of material that used to get on paper are um, are now online, student newspaper, etc. Um, in terms of the cloud, uh, addressing that is really be way beyond my. Um, my competency, but I think we all know that it's extremely, extremely complicated issues in terms of um, commercial owners, for example, of those cloud services, and uh, you know what happens if they don't survive. Um, there have been breaches, so it's again, I'm not qualified to really talk about that, but definitely an issue. Thank you. If any of you have any additional questions, we still have a few minutes, so please submit them via chat to all participants or via Twitter with the hashtag archival-advantage. Going, going, gone. <laughs> Okay, well, if you think of any afterwards, you can feel free to email Jackie. Her email address is right there, duallyj at OCLC.org. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate your attendance and participation. Um, we'd like to confirm that Jackie's 
Webinar slides are currently available online at the URL that we just posted there. And the, re the recording from this webinar will be posted in a couple of days on um, our website at the following URL that we just posted. We'll also post it on the OCLC Research YouTube channel. And we'll email all attendants and registra registrants of this webinar to notify you when that is available. So um, thank you again for joining us today. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.